Let's Get Down to Business is presented by Bravo, the marketing arm of Ash Brokerage Corporation, the practice enhancement company. All this week, it's tax advantage income with life insurance. And on today's show, life insurance and social security. And with me today is Ken Davis, CLU, CHFC, CFP, and CPA. Hi everyone, I'm Steve Savant, syndicated financial columnist and contributing author to Backroom Technician. Let's get down to business. Well, welcome to the show. Day two, Ken. Hey, Stephen. Hey, we're talking about Ken's wheelhouse today. We can't really get into Social Security. We're just doing it as it relates to what we're going to be talking about today, qualified plans and the impact of qualified plans on Social Security. And we're going to do a couple shows on this. So you'll want to check out uh, on, our, on my regular show, Steve Savant's Money, the name of the game, our consumer show, because Ken's excellent at this and it really positions your ability to get your practice in front of people. It's really a great entrance into the senior market. Yes, it is. Well, Ken, let's talk about it. Qualified plans. Okay. September about a year ago, a little over a year ago, they introduced the 408B2. It's full disclosure. I have to tell you everything that we're charging, whether it's admin fees, setup fees, the fund fees, the RIAs charge. They put all this on the table and I have to say again, and I don't mean to gripe about this too much, but again, I did not see the statement of additional information. Now I'm just bringing this up. I don't want to get into it, but I'm just saying, I'm going to look at all these fees and then look at that. And we're going to talk about that tomorrow and the expenses. We're going to get into it because I want to get into it now. But I want to talk about qualified plans. Everybody says the pre-tax contributions, especially if it's defined contribution like a 401k. Love that. I love tax deferred accumulation. I love that. I love when your employer wants to match portion of your contribution. I'm totally all over that. But remember, sooner or later, we're going to have to pay the piper on this. But what I didn't realize years ago as a young agent, and of course I know this now, is the impact of qualified plans on my Social Security and the taxation. Let's walk through the distribution. Because I think everybody understands the accumulation process. What they don't understand is the impact it has during distributions. Yeah, what's interesting about that is when we, do, when we do our analysis and our projections for retirement, we will use you know, current tax rates. Mm -hmm. Okay. But we're totally missing the boat. And the fact is that uh, so taxation of Social Security income affects and impacts middle class Americans greater than anybody else. There's that sweet spot where they cross the line where up, you know, 50% of their Social Security income over the threshold starts to become taxable. And then as they make more income, it starts to feed into, and it's pretty rapid, into 85%. Uh, mm -hmm. And even worse, you think, well, gee, part of it's a tax, 50% is taxable, and then 85%. Well, if you make enough money, then all 85% of your Social Security is taxable. Mm -hmm. It is not a stair-stepped approach. It's not. Now, so we really have two, if I hear you correctly, we have two tax brackets. We have our marginal tax bracket over here, ordinary income, but then Social Security is completely separate from that. Well, actually, the, it feeds into the marginal income tax bracket. What happens is we take our adjusted gross income. Everybody focuses on taxable income, but it's really AGI is mm -hmm. the key. Adjusted gross income on the bottom of the front page of the tax return is you take that and you add back in uh, things like half your Social Security plus your municipal bond interest, and that pushes you over a certain threshold, hmm. which then includes Social Security. So now suddenly, there's a portion of Social Security that drops on the front of the return, drops down to AGI, and then flows through the taxable income. So the marginal income tax bracket ultimately is applied against the original AGI plus the portion of Social Security that's now included. I wonder about the catch-22 because I'm taking my you know, my required minimum distribution. I'm trying to stall till age 70, right? Mm -hmm. But let's just say for our sake of discussion that when we're talking about this, that most people, especially boomers, we're trying to push this out to age 70. All of a sudden I take distributions, I'm taking my social security, and now the very thing, my retirement income, which is totally taxable, there is no basis. Mm -hmm. We now also have our social security and it's being taxed because we saved. Well, that's exactly right. And what's interesting is uh, I've been in some really geeky discussions in CPA educational forums where we, we compare a regular IRA to a Roth IRA, for instance. Mm -hmm. And the assumption is if the tax rate at the beginning and the end are exactly the same, the net effective after-tax income is, is pretty much exactly the same if you assume side investment funds on the same taxes. Well, 
with the fact that Social Security income may be taxed, it actually increases our effective rate dramatically. Mm -hmm. And so those assumptions are incorrect. For those that are wealthy enough that you've blown through the Social Security, and uh, even if you found ways to reduce your AGI, you're still going to be paying taxes to Social Security. Those people start entering the realm of a new tax, which isn't called a tax, and that is an increase in Medicare premiums based on what else? Modified adjusted mm -hmm. gross income. Okay? They're using a tax concept and tax numbers to drive premium on Medicare. That's a tax mm -hmm. as far as I'm concerned. They don't call it one. It's a different separate branch of the government, but it is a tax. And then finally, if you get high enough MAGI, you have Obamacare tax on top of a 39.6% rate and 85% taxation on your Social Security. It gets pretty nasty, and, and it gets worse as you make more income. Well, I'm always amazed at you. Know, I'm trying to do strategies for retirement, and I know I'm going to have to take out my qualified plans sooner or later. Actually, I, hopefully it's later so I can let it grow in the market. But we're seeing the impact of our qualified plans on Social Security. And you brought up something, just a little side note about tax brackets. You know, if I'm starting to, and, and I'm not questioning uh, qualified plan pre-tax, I'm just saying sometimes we're in such a low tax bracket during our accumulation years, I'm wondering really if it's worth it. Well, when we come back from the break, we're going to talk about the impact on Social Security benefits using an optimal strategy with life insurance. And don't forget, you can request any of the show's documents that we use as sample examples from Backroom Technician at ashbrokerage.com. And remember, you can sign up for your own 30-day free trial for Backroom Technician. Just go out to www.brtnow.com forward slash trial sign up dot ASPX. We'll be right back after the break. Take a close look at your hard-earned dollar. How do you think your money's doing? Are you keeping an eye on it? Is it protected from taxes, inflation, and market risk? Over time, those Washingtons could become Franklins. With Tax Advantaged Indexed Universal Life, from one of the largest distributors of Index Universal Life, Ash Brokerage. Well, welcome back. I'm Steve Savant with Ken Davis. And remember, you can watch all the episodes of Let's Get Down to Business, including my weekly consumer show, Steve Savant's Money, the name of the game, right at ashbrokerage.com. Just click on the show logo on the homepage. And remember, just a heads up, before moving forward with any of the ideas on the show, always consult your tax advisor and legal counsel, as well as your broker-dealer compliance officer. Well, let's get down to business. We're talking about the impact now of life insurance income on Social Security. We talked about the qualified plan. And remember, just before the break, I, want to, I don't want to get into too much of a debate here, but pre-tax, I'm looking at, if my tax bracket is small, I'm wondering if I should do this at all. You know, if I should really use qualified plan. Again, if, you're, if your employer's matching, I'm all over that. I want to do yeah, that all day long. Yeah. But I'm talking about if I'm down in the 15% blended effective tax rate, I'm wondering if I should be taking a deduction because I'm really, I could be injuring my ability to take my Social Security in tandem with life insurance, both out free. Well, that's exactly right because a qualified plan contribution, IRA or, or 401k or that type of thing, are all based on deductions. And if you get a relatively low marginal income tax bracket, it's really not doing much for you unless you have combined federal and state and city in, in like New York. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, you have to wonder about that because yeah, maybe you'll be at 15% when you uh, come out at the, the tail end or maybe by then you'll have grown, have more income, and, and it's higher. And we've always thought that when you retire, it's going to get lower. But the fact of the matter is it might be the same or above. And when you start throwing in the inclusion of Social Security income taxes, increased Medicare premiums, uh, potentially it, it, it gets worse. Well, when we look at some of the options, and we have, of course, participating whole life, we have current assumption universal life, we have indexing, foreign and domestic, we can use separate sub-accounts. All these things are really additives now that really can give our consumer a diverse choice when they're coming into life insurance, especially cash value life insurance. Now, you know, it, oh, it, it occurred to me, it, you know, we've talked about diversification of different types of tax-benefited assets, meaning qualified plans, life insurance, annuities, et cetera, all have their own different uh, tax, tax aspects of it. But you know, you just mentioned the investment choices. Well, what if you started with an index life 
and then it, it cruised along, and, and then now you're starting to draw on retirement. Well, maybe up front the client's a little more aggressive and should be in stocks or bonds or something else if the advisor feels that's appropriate. Uh, but later on as they approach retirement, they're going to be in a much more conservative position. So as we're doing these allocation models, maybe we just say, okay, we're going to use indexed life in this modeling to live on in retirement and get more aggressive in other parts of our portfolio. Mm -hmm. I think when you look at the diversity that you're talking about, whether it's tax diversity, whether it's investment diversity, whether it's timeline diversity, I mean, there's a lot of things to talk about. Mm -hmm. When I look at this ability to take my life insurance out, to remember three things, it's Tamra compliant, yep. we're using the lowest possible death benefit under the code, and we're keeping the policy in force for the life of the insured. When we take out withdrawals to basis and or policy loans to gain, this will not affect our social security benefit. That actual income. So if a person stalled their qualified plan out to age 70, I could be taking my Social Security out at 62 if I wanted to, as well as my life insurance without any taxation. And some people, I'm not saying we want to get into this on the show today, but some people use the reverse mortgage on their home, their life insurance, and their Social Security during this window period, and all of that is Tax-free tax free. So this is why we're looking at product that can fit into retirement strategies, and we're just giving you one of the options to optimize it. Well, I think options is a key word there, is that if I have three, four, five different types of assets with different tax treatment, the one thing we know for sure is the tax law changes, and it changes almost every year, and it can be quite substantial. Mm. And so who knows 10, 20, 30 years out when we retire what it's going to look like. So if we have a variety of different choices to pick from, we can actually then look at the time of distribution mm -hmm. and decide, do I want to take it from here or from here or whatever. Uh, I know one of the pieces of software that I use, uh, the order of distribution makes a massive change in the wealth that's passed to the mm -hmm. kids. Well, when I think about keeping my money during, let's say if you did in my example, from 62 to age 70, and you were taking your life insurance, your social security, and maybe even a reverse mortgage if that's where you want to go, and all that money's come out, it's stalling. That cash flow just got bigger. It well, just got bigger. Well, it's good for the social security because as we talked about in prior programs, you get another 8% simple per year from 66, which is normal retirement age today, to age 70. Uh, but also, qualified plans really are dependent on deferral. Mm -hmm. Deferral is the key thing. The longer you can defer those taxes, the better. And so if you have other sources that you can draw tax-free income from and not mess up your tax situation, mm -hmm. hallelujah, you get to, to grow those other assets and continue to defer until you're forced to take distributions at seven and a half. When you consider the tactical use of life insurance and retirement funding, I think you'll find that the withdrawals to basis and policy loans to gain, that, that tactical issues, again, as long as you keep the policy in force, can really be a tandem play with your Social Security benefits. Well, and let's not forget, we're focused on income today, but life insurance is life insurance. You die early, you've guaranteed funding to your loved ones that, you know, the, if you had a regular qualified plan and didn't have life mm -hmm. insurance, it, it stops there, it's dead in the water, and those that are dependent on that, your spouse, are, are, are hurt, okay? And even more so, if you want to include a, a disability rider on it to continue making payments uh, in the event of, of becoming disabled, it makes sure that your retirement fund, especially if you're overfunding a life mm -hmm. insurance and you have the kind of policy that will pay that kind of premium, will grow the cash value no matter what. We've presented these ideas to clients when they see the difference, especially the higher cash flow during 62 to 70 in my example, they're very excited about it. That's our show for today. I want to remind you that you can read all my online insurance commentary, advisor blogs, and articles on Producers Web, and all my answers to consumer questions on Insurance Library. And remember, you can always view all our shows on our on-demand section located at ashbrokerage.com. So don't forget, follow me on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, or email me, steve.savant, ashbrokerage.com. And remember, you could be wiser as an Ash Brokerage Advisor. I'm Steve Savant. See you tomorrow.